Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Christina Hoff Summers, just back from Australia. I'm Danielle Crittenden, and welcome back, Sheila. Oh, so <laughs> good I hear, to be here. I hear you had such a tough time, and it wasn't with dingoes or oh, wait, those, crazy snakes. Those were an issue. I, you know, on the plane, I had a lot of time. I didn't spend it wisely. I started researching dangerous threats that await you in Australia. And then I figured, okay, if I stay out of the ocean, because they have box jellyfish <laughs> and these blue ring stingrays, the most lethally dangerous animals in the world, you die a painful, agonizing death, and there's no antidote. I, no, and then the estuaries, you've got the crocodile, you've got dingoes in the outback. They have something called jumping jack ants, <laughs> killer ants. Oh, no. So I don't want to go to the bush. <laughs> so I think, okay, I'll stay in Sydney and take an Uber to the opera house. No, there's the Sydney funnel web spider. <laughs> <laughs> Except the biggest, t most terrifying creature, if we can say that, that you faced was not anything from nature. It was Roxanne Gay. Well, or... and, and the militant feminists who follow her. Oh. And we had a thousand people each night, but uh, they came. So tell us, start from the beginning. So so tell people what you were supposed to do, like two appearances, right? Melbourne and Sydney mm -hmm. in theaters. Yeah. Go. Well, it was supposed to be, so our host was this lovely guy uh, who is from Sri Lanka. He reminded me of Dev Patel and the beautiful <laughs> Hotel Marigold. He yeah. was full of oh. enthusiasms. He was Love a romantic, that. and he thought it was going to be wonderful that we would have two women. Who was are both... he part of an organization? Yeah, yeah he runs. He's a sort of an empresario, and he organizes. He he's brings in course. academics yeah. and so forth. And he had great hopes, and so did I. I thought, okay, she. I was surprised she was willing to do it because typically people of... Can you just tell us who is the wrongly named Roxanne Gay, because it really sounds like she should be named Roxanne Angry. Yeah. <laughs> but um, can you can you just give us a little thumbnail sketch of who she is? I don't want to say just, things what's mean her background? things, but it she it does have a tendency to... I mean, she could be fabulous because she's... she's Was a, she an academic? Is she, yes, yes, yes. She has some kind of degree. I'm not sure. It wasn't clear to me what it's in, but she's a writer. She's very popular. She write, does a lot of different things. She writes science fiction and... But she's written a book called Bad Feminist, but she's not really a bad feminist. She's kind of a hardcore down the line. And, you know, every other thing is white supremacy, male, you know, white male privilege, patriarchy. And I was trying to challenge that approach to the world, and it didn't go over well with her or her fans. And she sort of sat there and would look at me. On a stage in in, a, in an opera, not not the Sydney, the famous in opera In Sydney, house. we were in the beautiful Sydney Town Hall. Okay. And a thousand people. A thousand people. Wow. But 800 of them did not like me. They left her, and they just, you know, everything I said, they were stamping their feet. They were hissing. There were little... You're going, are any of you snakes? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I was like, are you sure that they were human? <laughs> All too human. Drinking, out, eating out of their boxes of jellyfish. Their box, <laughs> their box jellyfish. <laughs> Sydney funnel. Funnel web spiders. What could that be, a funnel web? Oh, anyway. No, but they, it turned out I didn't have to fear that. I had to fear the anger and irrationality. And I, tr I remained calm. Did you have a drink? I had, you know, they brought me a Cure Royale. Backstage. Yeah. And it didn't matter. It did not go well from the beginning. Everything I said got a very negative response from the audience. And everything she said, just riotous applause and mm. cheering. It was much easier on her. Although, interestingly enough, she ended up being very angry at, at our Desh, who was our yeah. moderator. Yeah. And... She demanded that uh, he not be the moderator in Melbourne, and she had so hands started in Sydney. Started in Sydney. She didn't like it. Apparently, doesn't want the tape released. I don't know why. I mean, she got a lot of cheering, and I was yelled at. But maybe just the very fact he was a man. No, I think she might regret some of her responses. Like I brought up, and he did too, the treatment of women in the developing world. And he had a little uh, video he played where he showed women in Indonesia facing these street monitors who come up to them and tell them that they're, 
their hijab or what their headscarf isn't covering enough of their hair or that they have shoes that are you know, pants are showing too much ankle <laughs> very we should have that on airplanes here i'm just saying you know when people bring come in shorts and a tank top or, or feet i don't want to see <laughs> bare okay. feet sorry digression go go sorry no i you know there's some truth <laughs> of it but anyway yeah um he showed it and it was it's it showed very dramatically that there are parts of the world that are well and and worse where women are getting whipped and raped and yes and, and, and that you know and, and what did she say i think you told me this after you came home that she she had something like we can't comment on other she cultures. said well i don't want to you know i don't we're not going to go in and tell them what to do and i said no Roxanne, we're not telling them what to do and i described some these international women's conferences I've attended, where you meet the women mm -hmm. who are the leaders of the women's movement in, let's say, Saudi Arabia, or coming from Malaysia, coming from Cambodia. And I said, let's just make common cause with them, help them, and do what they are asking us. I made it very clear that I didn't think we should go there like Lady Bountiful and tell them <laughs> what to do. I say, my good man, do <laughs> stop beating that lady. <laughs> and then she just didn't want to hear it. She said, well, Christianity is just as bad, and it's... And I said, well, uh, I don't know of any Christian societies that are issuing fatwas, and you know, I mentioned like the Charlie Hebdo, and she seemed to be against the Charlie Hebdo, and I don't know. So she may not want that to come out. She sounds like she was just against any interruption. <laughs> She's any... not used to being challenged. Yeah. So I think it was, I think she perceived it as just out of order and that, that this moderator was sort of neutral. Yeah. Rather than. And her fans just wanted to come and have a love fest. Yeah. And I got in the way. Yeah. Because I had a different point of view. So it did not go well. And I just, I never understand why the love fest, how, how it cannot be a love fest for you, Christina. I mean, you're just up there. You're so poised. You're polite. You're funny. I even complimented her in, after she'd it called She called me you a white supremacist. White supremacist. Said, well, she changed it. She said white supremacist adjacent. And then you said, I, I'm, you corrected her and said, I'm a white wine yes, supremacist. Yes, I said, which, a you which mean. you're not really. <laughs> which you're not really. You're more of a champagne supremacist. but Definitely a champagne <laughs> but. but So none of my jokes worked. I told her I was a white wine supremacist, and that just made people furious. I wasn't taking it seriously. <laughs> you're, you're, if you were a real white white supremacist, you would have taken it way more right. seriously right. and refused to go on a stage with her. I couldn't joke, and I couldn't um, reason with the audience. Mm -hmm. Every point that I made, it just increased their wrath and... They were very angry at poor Desh, who was trying to make the best of it. Oh, so I was telling you, she, uh, Roxanne and her agent, who kept call, apparently calling Desh uh, all night long, was saying, you have to have a new moderator. And they handpicked an oh. aboriginal woman that she had met, <laughs> and that was going to be our moderator. <laughs> and I said, well, what's her name? Let me look her up. And I did look her up. She actually seemed fine, but I don't think she knew anything but, about... But you can't do that. It, it's the, you Plus, can't just fire the person who's... I said to him, I said, you it's through. your event. She's agreed to come, and yeah. you're being mad. Maybe you should just, you know... So he clearly... I, I mean, I don't know what happened, but he ended up moderating yeah. in Melbourne as well. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the grounds for firing him is that... Imagine that she just... I think that she thought it was very unfair that he played that tape showing the oppression of women in Indonesia. Now, what could be more... Because it makes her oppression look really lame. Is right. That... <laughs> <laughs> oh, help, I'm being oppressed. Yeah. <laughs> but what I, I remember, I, I mean, I was far away in Mexico City while you were fearing ants. I was eating ant larvae, which is a specialty in Mexico City. I, I, it, I'm like, sorry to hear it's that. It's like a very buttery result. <laughs> oh. And then they sprinkle little black bloated ants on top of it. I didn't try that, but I And did. you did this out of your own free will? No, I I was I got dared because we were with someone who ate it and if you dare as you know, if you dare me to do anything, I will do it. Yeah, I I, I lost will jump a bet. off that bridge. I lost a bet to, or <laughs> did something. I lost something uh, in a Mexican restaurant in Houston, Hugo's. It was and I had to eat a grasshopper. <laughs> And I, well, grasshopper is garnish. Oh, I'll never forget it. It was oily. Anyway, no, but there I am in Mexico City, and I'm following what's happening to you on Twitter. 
And the funniest thing I thought that I saw that came up, this did not resound well on your opponent. It was uh, just a frozen screen of you on, I guess, Australian morning television or something, with you on one side, Roxanne Gay on the other, and underneath you it said, the factual feminist, and underneath her it said, bad feminist. <laughs> that, that title is not working for you, Roxanne. It's, the irony is not, you know, coming through. But you said, I think the biggest reaction you got, like negative, because I'm assuming you didn't get big positive from what you're saying, is on rape instruction. There's this new study that has come out that shows if young women on campuses get self-defense instruction and 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 prevention tactics that it that it helps absolutely and, and you got booed or something I what tried happened? to tell them and actually I brought it up not even to highlight the study though I should have done I brought it up to show that w- women are being harmed by this rigid ideology in feminism it's so rigid I said that has the very unusual consequence of being effective and actually protecting women if it doesn't Meet, match every little dogma in their catechism, they reject it. This, th- this study showed that w- with a 12-hour training, you could teach women uh, to be more aware of their environment and to pick up cues that suggested danger so they could assess risk, and they learned a little self-defense. And they also did some exercises to where they learned sort of to predict how they would react and how they should react, and they were able to define their sexual boundaries and be clear about that. Twelve hours, and this study, this program, developed by two feminist researchers. In Canada, if I may say. Yeah, Windsor University. Yeah. and But it's been replicated. It's, there's also a University of Oregon had a similar team, a similar program. Right. And, it, and the New England Journal of Medicine reviewed it, and it, it passed they had a very well-designed study and showed that young women that went through this program, it cut their risk in half of a kind of you know sexual assault or predation of any kind. So I read about it. Not only did I think I would tell it definitely to my daughter, I wished I had had it because it, it just made you, it just increased your, it was empowering, let me put mm-hmm. it that way, in a very good way. Well, the audience in Australia they went crazy. They were enraged. What did they do? Did they? They said with rotten fruit. They would. They would have. And some people actually <laughs> rubber thought dildos. That they, they thought there might be. <laughs> they thought across. they might uh, tar and feather me. <laughs> and then Roxanne got a riotous applause. She said, "No, we're going to just teach men not to rape. It's not women's responsibility." I said, "Of course, it's it, it, teach men not to rape." I said, "That's fine, but." There, you know, one percent of the population are socio or psychopaths, and two or three percent sociopaths. You can't teach people not to be evil because right. some people are evil no matter what. And why not help women be prepared? Right. We oh. have to teach robbers not to rob. We have to teach, you know. Right. So when you cross the street, don't tell your child to look both, both ways. ways. It's up to the drivers not to hit pedestrians. Well, there are some crazy drivers out there, no matter what. You tell your child, you, you give them the equipment. This is so elementary. Mm-hmm. They couldn't hear it. They, they did not want to hear it. And they and then they start tweeting madly that she said that men can just do whatever they want, but women have to learn not to be raped. No, I never said men can do whatever they want. But you yeah. might not have a multifaceted program, be very clear with men, but also empower women. And actually, men could benefit from this because they, they can learn not to get into bad situations. Everyone should have a little bit of self-defense and, a, a, you know, a, a ca- right. capacity for risk Right. Assessment. I actually, so, so we looked up this study that you were talking about, um, and it did say that the risk of rape for 450 win- women who were randomly assigned to this program mm-hmm. was, was about 5% compared with nearly 10% among the 442 women in a control group who did not have this course. It, it cut in half their, so it, their risk it cut for it assault in half. and so forth. And then it said, like, the core of it, it was developed by feminists, and it, the core of it, and quoting one of the um, people who, the women who developed it, said that young women had been taught just to be on guard against the stranger rapist, to fear the shadowy campus at night, the deserted parking lots, rape by an acquaintance or a romantic partner, which is far more common, mm-hmm. 
uh, is not a concept they had considered. So as you said, it, 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 it was empowering. Like, obviously you don't walk across a shadowy campus at night all by yourself or without being highly aware. But we're getting into these situations where people are drinking too much, they're, they're being taken advantage of. And it's a lot of young women. It it's the freshman um, year. It's their first party. things you regret, you know. And this teaches them right away just to be more self-aware and more and just ready. And what I liked about it, one of the researchers said that it's it's the opposite of making women frightened because mostly you can hang out with men. Most of them are fine. They're not going to hurt you. But there is that instance where you could be hurt and it sh and there are some danger signs you should be aware of if he's trying to isolate you and you know pry, pl plying you with alcohol there's just several things to be aware that this could be a situation you don't want to be in right well of course young women sh should know that going off to college and well but this is then to go to the criticism of it which is what you encountered in a more violent way. <laughs> uh, here's here's a quote of the criticism it places the onus for prevention on potential victims possibly obscuring the responsibility of the perpetrators and it treats rape as an inevitable threat that women must guard against rather than something that men could be taught not to do. And that goes back, of course, to teaching robbers not to rob. But here's the other thing, that, the thing that really bothers me about this. I don't know if I ever told you this, but years and years ago when I was researching my first book, What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us, available on Amazon, <laughs> um, was I went to a lot of these campus uh, rape crisis centers. So this would have been in the 90s. Um, and this that that idea of a, a campus even having a rape crisis center was kind of a new idea. And you think, well, this is a wonderful thing to have, right? That mm -hmm. there is resources now for women, places to go uh, when they feel they've been harmed. Right. And I began to uh, read the manuals. And honestly, it was like reading manuals from old, you know, communism of the 19, 1930s, you know, where you are trying to take, say, the experience of the proletariat or the, a working class person and turn it into anger, right? you know, against the, the, the ruling class. Right. And when you read these rape manuals, it was taking something, one of the most horrible things you can imagine happening to you as a woman. And instead of saying, you know, we need to get you help. We need to get you through this. We need to make you get you back to having healthy relationships with men, right? You would think that would be the goal. Right. Because there there because there is no such thing. But there was no and it and it said once you have gotten I remember this very vividly, one of the instructions to the counselors was once you have got the woman through the immediate, you know, twenty four trauma. hour trauma of it, then you were supposed to start in making her aware of this it's really about a power dynamic that this could happen with anybody you know any man that that this is the dynamic between the sexes between the husbands sexes. boyfriends it was all about a male assertion of power and as we've talked when we had Emily Yaffe on to talk about the Harvey Weinstein and other sort of sexual psych uh, sexual pathologies sexual pathologies that men who rape are not your average guy. Right. And most men don't, you know. And you, like I wanted to say to this audience, you know, most men want what you want. They want love. They want ten tenderness. They they don't want to hurt you. They want to make you happy. I mean, and, and often be very protective of you to yes. sound old fashioned. But yes, absolutely. And men I have found are as horrified by, you know, rapists and, and brutal predators as, as women. And protecting ourselves from them is something men and women, good, men and women of goodwill can do together and have always done. But they want to make it into But it's that politicization. No, it's, poli the po it's politicizing your experience. Right. And that is propaganda. That's not based on fact. It's They've been doing it forever. And, you know, I was thinking about it because there was such resistance that... A lot of people will use sexual violence examples to forward their cause. I mean, not to make an example of our president, but when he wants to turn people against illegal immigrants and tell stories that 
demonize them. He talks about rapists on the border, you know, and then he exaggerates yeah. the predation. And I've seen the, some people who want to uh, demonize Muslims in Europe. They'll exaggerate the yeah, sexual to, to predation women. and yeah. make it seem like... And also that plays into a, a, the, 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 the awful racial stereotype, too. Well, These are exactly. foreign men. And, of course, we, had it, we had it with lynching. Yeah. So people have to be very careful because it, people do react very emotionally. And they are, for good reason, repelled at the idea of a, of a, a sexual transgressor. But it's, I think it's very um, t- bad that it's, as you said, it's all been politicized and, and people use it to... Maybe not deliberately, but they do manipulate but, others by these stories, these exaggerations. Right. And, and here, here is a study. Now, I will tell you, the New York Times reported on this this new right. program, Vox, a New York magazine by feminist writers that wanted to be against it, but they they became persuaded that this should be part of any responsible program. And I tried to convey that to the audience, to, but they were not open to the possibility and the fact that I even brought up such a study was proof that I did not belong on the stage, (laughs) you know, that I was... Yeah. Well, I mean, can you imagine also, as you say, it just goes against common sense uh, about not even street, what we, you call street proofing your daughters, you know, that, that I have two daughters. I remember a very funny story about my eldest daughter, Miranda. She lived, as you know, in Israel for three years and she got... She got very street proofed in Israel. And she came home to visit family in Toronto, very polite Canadian, you know, city. And she was at a turnstile when a very sketchy man came and approached her, a turnstile on the subway. And he started to come up to her and was getting way too close and was asking her for money. But And she looked up and she saw two gentlemen coming, seeing her in a little bit of, you know, Trouble. this situation. And they started to walk briskly towards her, clearly to help her out. At which point she went full Israeli on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> What'd she do? And she started. She, to... she just went yelling at him and saying, get away from me. And your story makes no sense. You know what? That This program, <laughs> that's what the program and recommends. Like, and she said, he had been asking, like, I need it for this bus. She goes, there is no such bus. Get away from me. And by the time the men got up to her, they, they saw what was happening. Oh, she can take care of it. No <laughs> well, interestingly enough, one of the things the study suggests is that apparently a lot of women, when they're in an uncomfortable situation or a terrible situation, it's get, they get kind of quiet and weepy. Yeah. And it turns out the best thing to do is to be really loud and obnoxious and just... It's and like dealing with bears. Did you ever get those instructions in national parks about what to do when a bear comes up? I know, but I would run. <laughs> I but you're supposed to apparently, you know... I was like in a, a situation. A I was in Alaska exactly in a, on a that. crazy, like, grizzly bear hike. Mm. And then I lost my fellow hikers. And actually, they abandoned me, but that's another story. And I was just walking along, <laughs> and I was... I was aware that I could be attacked and destroyed by a grizzly bear. So I started to bark because they're, they don't <laughs> like dogs. So when I'd go around to Ben, I'd go, rawr, rawr, rawr. <laughs> I'm glad there's no film of that. <laughs> you know, I think they should incorporate this knowledge into that course. So about grizzly girls, bears. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. Girls, no. When no, you, when no it, bears shouldn't attack. Don't teach. <laughs> Don't teach. We we just have to teach the grizzlies not to attack. Especially when they're with their small children, their small cubs. You know, you should be able to walk right up to that mother bear and stroke the cubs because they're cute. And why should she attack? Why shouldn't you be able to do that? Why why why, why don't we have that freedom? Right. Well, speaking of, (laughs) I don't want to call it assault. When we were setting up, you said very eagerly you wanted to talk about Joe Biden. Now, let's just... Put, make sure we know that we're not a partisan podcast. We try avoid politics, especially when the politics might be outdated by the time yeah. this podcast airs. So stipulate we're recording on Thursday and the podcast is going to be out next Tuesday. But that being said, you've had such an interesting reaction to this whole Joe Biden stuff. I want to I want to hear about okay, it. Okay. Initially, I thought, oh, here we go again. Me too gone too far. 
And I thought it'll be a good learning experience. You know, Democrats will see that this is going to end. They're going to, it's going to take out everybody. And all Joe was was friendly and, uh, you know, a little overly demonstrative. And um, so I was, you know, on his side. And I, I guess I kind of liked him. And I welcome him as a candidate because, I've, well, we're not going to talk politics. But right. I did welcome him. And I thought maybe we just need an old-fashioned moderate Democrat. And it was terrifying to me that, like Al Franken, he was going to be thrown out just because of they keep enlarging the meaning of mm-hmm. of sexual harassment to include things that are just boorish behavior or silly behavior. However, a friend of mine sent me some compilations of videos. Have you seen them? Uh, no. Okay. Brace yourself. Uh-oh. Is, is, he's it, a, he's is a, it X-rated? Is it Joe no, Biden it's, it's, unleashed? He's a weird dude. And he's obsessed with sniffing women's hair Mm -hmm. and the hair of little girls. And he's feasting on all these women. I'm now beginning to think maybe he became a politician and maybe he focused a lot on women's issues so he could have all these... These, um, you know, highly structured events where he gets to, you know, graduations where you get to hug people. But he, he, he's always hugging from behind, isn't he? he? Yeah, he, because he wants to get so to the hair. <laughs> he, he's obsessed with the hair. And, and the, so initially the oh. woman... Oh. No, I'm, no, I could be wrong and no, I am willing no, to I'm, be corrected. I'm, I, now that you say it, even without watching the video, that all the pictures where women are objecting, it's like he kissed the back of my head, Right. And there's like there's one there's a little girl beautiful little girl and then you could see him thinking and then when am I going to go in and then he goes in and it's it's I don't know what okay well let's let's just say it's a hair fetish that's right. not even sexual did he, does he do this with waves of male locks does no I have not seen it yeah it would be disturbing mm-hmm. if it were males but it with the women I think there might be something just a little. Um, what is the word we would use? It's not uh, a <laughs> violation. It's definitely creepy. Yeah. But it's something more than creepy. I think it's a It's f- like a fetish. Kinky. It's, it's and, really a fetishy. And that he, he, I think he kind of enjoyed that he could do it in public yeah. with impunity. Yeah, because he's, he's Uncle Joe, you know? Like, never, no, like, at least for me, people in my generation really like Joe Biden, especially girls. Like, yeah. people, and when you think of, like, Parks and Rec, like Leslie Nope. Her obsession with Joe Biden on that show, I think, made him sort of the superstar. Oh. So I think it's we- like it's weird for me to watch it because I was a big fan of his. But I I would think about like if someone I really admired who was a man did that to me. I think. Well, let's just... let's let's okay let's let's just say uh, okay maybe it's a weird fetish not meant to be harassing whatever. The problem that the Democrats have now is having made. Al Franken resign. Right. That was their mistake. That was their mistake because now, you know, because this isn't who, as serious. This but this isn't as serious. In a maybe way, it's weirder. But it creepier. might be. I think it's. I mean, look, I think it's uh, much more worrisome because right. it's just a. It's perverse <laughs> and odd, and he got away with it. I think he must have known something that he was getting to, able to do it. He would just feast on these but women it, in these occasions, it, and it doesn't mean he's not. I mean, he seems like uh, I've watched interviews with him. I have the same reaction. He's like this incredibly compassionate, thoughtful, decent man who's had the worst of oh yeah bad things luck, brought bad, upon horrible you. tragedies, Tra- horrible tragedies. He's also a blowhard though, and he, he he talks too much. There's a story I can't confirm, but that he was uh, he, a uh, mansplainer. No, uh, terrible, and that Obama was. Pre- uh, f- Former President Obama was at some lunch and he wasn't sure who the speaker was and it was going to be Joe. And he said to the guy next to him, just kill me now. You know? <laughs> and when he gets up to speak, it's, he goes on and on obsessively. And yeah. I think he's a problematic figure. I think he he's yeah, not going to. He, yeah. Well, we knew these stories were going to come out because that, those, these are long. Standing. They've been around. Um, but, you know, I worked in a newsroom in the 80s. And the stuff that Al Franken did, I mean, at that time he was a comedian. See, that he was, was on funny. a USO. I mean, it was, as you say, it was boring. Boorish. And... But that happened all the time. And maybe in retrospect, we can look back and go, okay, that was a stupid joke. But if somebody had done that to me, and that was, for those of you who don't remember it, it's, he was posing and he was uh, with a female perf- 
performer and the photographer on this USO tour. USO, he's doing entertaining the troops. Yeah. And and it's and, uh, and burlesque. The, I mean, there's a lot of uh, and he and the risque woman humor. Got along fine and she was asleep one time and he posed with his hands as if on her breast for the photographer and they're doing their goofy, you know, hey, look at this while she's asleep, but he wasn't touching her. And it was stupid, fine, but but to lose your Senate seat over that, or it was, it was pathetic. And I blame it was sad. I blame Jill, uh, Senator Gillibrand. Yeah, she, is that but, how you pronounce her name? Yeah, yeah. It suddenly sounds strange. What a strange name. <laughs> she, I think she took him out, and yeah. I think that, and, and so that's this bothers me too about Biden because I do think it might be the Sanders campaign. That's yeah. promoting it, and you know, well, and, and Klobuchar and all of them uh, have a lot of reason to get behind that rumor. But that's, he, he's leading; he's leading in the polls. Yeah, no, but that's right. So, so his own opponents will will play dirty with him. But, but unfortunately, this is being hoisted on your own petard. Problem is having, having drawn, ha- having made the Franken rule the the precedent. Right. I don't know how. Well, we like him. We think he's got the best chance of winning. That, like that doesn't, you know. There's even more to it. Joe Biden himself was an enabler of the most kind of hysterical feminist politics, and he, for example, those new rules that were imposed in that dear colleague letter, but posted on the universities in 2011. Can he you, was. Can you can you say what that was? Yeah. So, I forget. so what they did was they sent out this dear colleague and who was they. The Department of Education. Yeah. But he was a part of it. And he was yeah. there for the ceremony, very much behind it. And these new rules made it, so basically it took away due process from young men. And it all had to be like uh, victim informed. And what that meant was the guy, the kid, the young man would be presumed guilty. They enlarged the meaning of harassment. Mm-hmm. It had, the Supreme Court had defined it as, you know, severe, pervasive, obnoxious behavior that makes it impossible for you to get an education. They changed it to just anything that made you uncomfortable. And um, so they couldn't be off-color jokes. You could be brought up on a Title IX mm-hmm. charge if you made a woman uncomfortable with just about anything. So it was, a, it was terrible for free expression. And it was terrible for due process, and it was Joe Biden's work. Mm. And so now you say about being hoist on your own petard. Yeah. He is, he he created a monster, and that monster is now devouring him. And that monster is now called hair sniffing. <laughs> That's well, not going to be allowed. Hey, didn't you tell me one of just quickly, and then we'll go, move on to the next. I topic. want to tell you that I have taken a picture. You were asleep in a plane. <laughs> And there's a picture of me, <laughs> but I won't I post it. I knew it. No, you, you've you taken a picture of me asleep um, doing my, par- uh, my party trick. I call this my party trick, Christine. She does fall asleep at dinner parties <laughs> at the table. <laughs> yeah. I, I, not, I, I don't Not mind always. It. At only if you're parties. boring me, darling. And I, just, I say to the guests, oh, she always does that. Carry on, carry on. Wait, just like head down on the table? Yeah, it's yeah. sort of like, uh, what's that? That's when, when you, people fall asleep, like automatically. Um, a narcolepsy? Not, yeah, it's like, but it's not. <laughs> you just because you're bored? me. You just, just get bored? bored? No, it's when I've had a lot of wine. I just <laughs> subtly drift off it's, it's and you say you you do protect me and, then and I, you know what you look beautiful <laughs> i i have to say i will post the photo we can't no no we'll not post that photo <laughs> and i won't post the photo of you doing bad things but last thing before we leave this topic because it, it's it sort of sums up what we've been saying you said at this event with, with roxanne Roxanne Gay that a woman had said a man kept asking her to have sex. Oh, God. I, I was so good. Oh, that, 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 okay. Just that last story. So I'm triggered by this. <laughs> There's a woman who stands up. It, this is in Melbourne. And she just wanted to tell me how, how upset she was by everything I'd said because she said, I am a rape victim. And, and I felt bad for her. And I, you know, I was immediately thinking, well, how could she not know that I, I want to do everything I can to yeah. protect a woman from rape? But somehow that... And, so, but she said it in a sinister way, directed at you. At me. Kind of thing. Yeah. And I wait, but she kept talking and talking. And then as she, she talked, she said, yes, I was raped. I was in college and um, I'm a survivor and my trauma, you know, has haunted me since then. And she kept talking and then she proceeded to describe the rape. And she said, 
yes, and, you know, it was, it was this guy, I think it was her boyfriend, but and he just kept asking me for sex, and he kept wanting it and, and you know, whining about it and carrying on, and, and I just eventually gave in. <laughs> that was her rape. That he, he you said, I, I you know, said. I was thinking like that's a, that sounds like um, a lot of married sex, <laughs> but I didn't I didn't say it, even though it's kind of true. You know, at that, come on, marrieds out there, you know, one and it could be a different person sometimes, but sometimes people whine and want, and the others like not in the mood. We won't go there. But that's what she described, but she calls that rape. And then I thought other people in the audience would think, what the hell? That wasn't... No, they were like, oh, so sorry for her. You know, it's a good thing I wasn't there with you, Christina, because I know that what my problem is, not that I would fall asleep during that thing, although I might have, was... You know me when 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 we you and I would go and do these talks together, and you would always be the good cop, mm-hmm. and somebody would do something like that, and then you would, would have just you would have launched. <laughs> I would have launched. I would have said, "Sounds like marriage,", marriage. <laughs> and, then, and then just taken the the the, the flying dildos. Well, you know what? The I've made. I, I okay. I am now taking a vow. I shall not travel. I shall not do these venues. Without my co-splainer. Yeah, yeah. I need you there. I don't want to be alone on the stage and take all the wrath of... I stipulate, I think, some a lot of unbalanced people who have latched on to this ideology as just a way to organize their own madness. Yeah. Well, I I don't want to set you off again. I'm, I'm moving topics. Um, just to alert our listeners, we have so much to catch up on post-spring break that we're not having a guest this week. So... We're our own guests. We're our own guests with Zoe, of course, who was, by the way, in Madrid. I was. In the... I was. I actually... We were both speaking Spanish. Yeah. I was actually wasn't in Madrid that long. We went all over Spain. Did you go to Barcelona? Barcelona. Barcelona. Oh, no. You don't say Barcelona. That's how it's pronounced by... The Catalan. You say... Did you go to a bullfight? No. Do they it's not still the have season, it? and I, I don't think they have them. Yet. I would never go. I think they're so cruel and brutal and horrible. Well, I know, would like to go to one, though. I mean, it might be interesting. No, I mean, no. it's just romanticized. Well, they're, they're no, brutal. I think it's primitive and brutal. I feel like you guys would be happy about this, then. They changed one of the historic bullfighting rings in Barcelona into a shopping mall now. Oh, I thought you were going to say into, like, a center for... Grief bull and, petting. And no. Bull pe- a, pe- a, a petting zoo. <laughs> it's literally a mall. A bull petting zoo. <laughs> you know what? If they didn't have to kill the bull, that would be better. Just to have them yeah. run around. A little dance. A little. A little da- I like the manadors, though. Mm. Yeah, well, Christina. <laughs> and um, I met a cute guy in Australia, too. Oh. Never mind oh, that. He gave me a tour of Sydney. Oh, how old? I have photos. How old? No, he could be my son. Oh, yeah, well, well, I looked yeah. up what a funnel web spider was, and I, I doubt it's not it like was a that. funnel cake. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's it's this really terrifying, like thick, leathery black thick. spider that makes its webs literally are like a long cylinder. So when things get caught in it, they can't. But uh, I'm still out. with the box jellyfish funnel spiders like funnel cake like can't you just see the audience for Roxanne Gray eating jellyfish and spiders okay that's um, kind of right um, okay so so we're going to catch up on uh, uh, one, one last story and then we had so much fun listener reaction while we were away including I think so we like one or two people who again unwisely wrote in asking for advice yeah the worst advice on the web the <laughs> worst advice on the web I come don't to feel us like we're gonna ruin any marriages with the questions yeah. that we have I mean that answer around. to the married couple <laughs> and you you and David practically broke them up I, I well no I think we brought them together the Romeo oh, they, and Juliet they did syndrome. they united against you <laughs> in in in, uh. in England so one of the stories that caught my eye while we were away was the spacesuit saga, spacesuit gate. Did you see this in your uh, travels? I did. <laughs> this is, um, and I think we're going to have different reactions. Okay. So this may be part of the podcast where you're going to play the part of Roxanne Gay. <laughs> oh, thanks. And you're going to be all like, no, oh, the patriarchy stuff. doesn't okay. have spacesuits that fit us. Does this spacesuit make me look fat? Yes. <laughs> All spacesuits make everybody you know look Th- fat. That's one issue. They're not very cute. 
They're puffy. They look like marshmallows. They do. Anyway, okay, so here's the spacesuit problem. The first all-female spacewalk was canceled because there weren't enough of the correctly sized spacesuits. They apparently had two women who needed medium-sized, but they only had one medium-sized. Hey, we've all faced that, right? When especially when you and I shop, Christina, yeah, yeah. you you know. You you always, you, no, I don't. You yeah, I don't the grab last the first. One. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes it's me. We buy the same clothes. I know. But anyway, but NASA, the spokeswoman said. They, they didn't have two, so in this case, it was easier and faster to change space, spacewalkers than reconfigure the spacesuit. And, of course, they changed spacewalkers with a man so that that all-female uh, spacewalk didn't go off. And then the reaction, I'm reading now from the Washington Post, across social media platforms, women told of giant overalls, wading boots that were the wrong size, oversized gloves that kept them from being nimble, a lack of bulletproof vests that accommodated their chest sizes, and a dearth of petite-sized personal protective equipment at construction sites. I work in an ambulance where everything from the driver's seat to the latch on the cot is made for your average size man, tweeting one woman based in <coughs> Canada. Uh-oh. I know. Yeah, you know. Okay. Okay. Can I just. Uh, no, no. I know this intimately and felt an angry pit of experiential empathy in my stomach when I heard about this spacewalk cancellation. So we had talked about this issue a couple, few episodes back with Carolyn Criedo, not with her, about her. Yes, Carolyn Criedo Perez, who is the author of Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. And she just argued, like, this is this case, this story sums it up that there are many, many professions and situations that are all calibrated to the average male, she would say the average white male, and, um, and women, again, uh, lose out. So, Christina, is it, isn't this sad? Aren't you upset about this? Okay, I'm taking a deep breath. <laughs> and um, I just want to say, like... You size supremacist. No, it's so much kvetching. Mm-hmm. And, okay... Ladies, all these ladies that shook to soup social media, if it's a real problem, start a website and sell, uh, you know, unusually sized materials for women. In you know, make it a business if it's an issue. Why always complain and whine? They didn't make it for us. Now, here's this NASA thing. Uh, first of all, the the big story here is that there are so many women in the space program and that they could have an all women team and this didn't everything has to be a first we already had a woman in space with sally ride when did she go in like 83 we've had women in space but this is like two women in space so we have to have so it's a sacred moment no it's not it, and, and they just had to put in a, a guy so it was a guy and a girl and a guy and a lady in space and then they, they'll have the two women later you know it was postponed and the reason that they didn't have a suit is she had trained in a large suit, wanted a, and then at the last minute realized that she should have a different size suit. And they weren't just ready at that moment. So this becomes, you know, a huge issue of gender discrimination. No, it's women kvetching. And then, oh, I read one quote that said something about how men... NASA has been making a, uh, but no, no, this is a good thing, that NASA has been making a concerted effort to improve diversity. Its 2017 astronaut class had five women and seven men. Now, that is fantastic. Houston, we have an angry astronaut. Houston, Houston, get us out of here. Houston, we have a big problem. <laughs> She's mad. She's mad. No, but I, I, let me finish my point. Okay. Oh. But situating this event in context makes clear that in a field historically dominated by men, there are myriad ways for bias to manifest. Yes, it's dominant. Men invented it. And (laughs) you go back, I think everyone should should serve penance and go watch the film First Man, which is about the NASA mission in 69, July. With very cute Ryan Gosling, who is a Canadian. Who's kind of a hot dude. But anyway, (laughs) so the lunar landing. um, That's not appropriate. Uh, then this was this is, so this was in 1969, and these as almost all men, I'm sure there were some women there, but they got this this they did this mission. They ha- had hardly any computers. They just and they did it. 
the ingenuity, the beauty. Well, it's like Tom Wolfe, the right stuff that these men, yeah. just who had been fighter pilots in World War II, would sit themselves on the top of rockets and get agree to be blasted into and space. Basically, <laughs> who had the right? No, it. Why can't we be grateful once in a while? And yeah, men did this, and so a lot of it is based on their metrics. And then you just adjust and you fix. And women are joining men. They usually, they're the ones that put themselves out there and take the incredible risks. And they have these these ex- extraordinary feats of ingenuity. I ha- I would like to see women do that. but And maybe they will. That could change. And maybe the next generation of women will take a while. But... Why do why do we have to have this it's attitude? Anger. Okay, I agree with you on that. I'm just looking at the. I wanted the to pushback. I wanted to bicker. Okay, I'll bicker. But uh, I was going to say I was reading like today. It says only 15 percent of NASA's planetary mission science team members are women, and that doesn't include Sigourney Weaver. But you could also say only 15 percent of NASA's planetary mission team is women, and. They haven't yet made all the suits. So I think what is actually, this is a conflated, somebody really screwed up. I think actually, you know what? No, it's that, I mean, I agree with you. Why do, why does every, this is clearly a, whoever didn't order and make sure there were enough suits for this historic moment should be demoted, fired, whatever. But no, to but turn it into this. Yeah, stop being angry, for gosh sakes. Just see that. This is I a agree question. With you on that. This is a I'm question so I, I, I asked myself with. I want to be Roxanne gay. gay. I want to be gay. And you know what I said? She, I was worried she was going to drop out of the second yeah. debate. And so what I and I couldn't talk to her directly. We were at the Melbourne airport. I mean, we were at the Sydney airport on our way to Melbourne, and he was going back Did and you forth. Have to sit next to her. She no, she was behind me. Ooh, because we were in did first you, class. Did you put your seat back? Uh, you know, when I did, and I thought, I hope this isn't an issue. <laughs> She'll be mad at me. Sometimes people get mad behind, but it was, it was, uh, no. So Desh was going back and forth, and uh, I said, Desh. I said, here's what I want you to tell her. I said, and I meant this, uh, that men who disagree with each other are able to go on tour. So you've had, like, Robbie George go with Cornell West, and they disagree on everything, but they are intelligent, and they are humane people, and they have a discussion. I said, tell her, there are no women. Can you think of any women that would go around debating? Just tell me. I want to know who they are. The only ones I can think of are like Hoda and Kathy Lee on the, like, the Today shows. <laughs> Don't they agree on everything? Yeah. I guess there's the view women, but they those those come to like cat fight bloodbaths. Right. They, they, that's you know, true. Like, I, and I don't think they talk to each other offset. And they actually do fight. They and really now fight. one of them is uh, one who was on there has written a book and needed therapy, <laughs> having been on the view. Because we can't take women. We, we, women are natural. And I used to find this my first realization that that this kind of healthy argument or disagreement wasn't didn't fly amongst women was when I became a new mother and I went to you know you f- go to these mommies groups and they're not composed of people you would naturally select as friends they're composed of people who have kids yeah. the same age as yours and are nearby and your kid maybe likes their kid but you have to be there because you know you yeah. can't just drop your one year old off and I remember being that opinionated person. Oh, yeah. But like, but not about politics <laughs> or anything. Just about anything. It was like pacifiers, you know? Right. And, and then you'd say, oh, By the I way, love, I love them. I love them. I say that. <laughs> and they looked at you like you just said you love smoking. I couldn't have gotten through cigarettes or something. Oh, no. and, and I like it. I like a pacifier. But, but, then, but then they wouldn't debate you. Like I They would just be thought a, you were weird. No, they would all go silent. And then somebody would shift uncomfortably and then the subject would change and then a- another female friend of mine who also had the similar misfortune of saying direct things like I did she said oh they put you in the mad woman's corner didn't they <laughs> and she, that was her phrase that whenever you had a woman who was you know opinionated or whatever they 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 agreed after the first few uncomfortable times that you erupted with these strong opinions, <laughs> they would say, oh, that's just Danielle. Right. She's mad, right, you right, know, right. and that was the way they coped 
with and so as women we experience it right i think i think women i think this is why feminism works affects so many women I think okay but i just want to ask take uh, conflict yeah they can't take conflict but did you also notice when we were young mothers that only mothers could be friends with other mothers you couldn't have like a working mother full-time working mother in the playground. Oh, yeah. Those were the mommy wars. The mommy. Those are the days of the mommy wars. I think they still exist. They're just like guerrilla style now. It's like gone you don't total talk about gorilla and it's online on Twitter. But, but, but women need parity in their friendships and relationships with other women. And I don't know why. I've actually got a bunch of theories, which I will not bore you with now, lest you put me in the mad woman. Do you think this could have some reason? Just I'm not saying it, but everything like you're saying now and being acting out a little bit at baby groups. Could this be the reason for your low rating with Uber drivers? <laughs> Stop. You said you would never bring that up. Oh. <laughs> I, oh, is low. Oh, oh I can't believe you brought no, that up. No, because I, I, I have a, not a perfect rating because I... You have a 4.9. Yeah, but I don't have what? a... I do, too. This but that's like because I take Izzy, and school. sometimes the drivers don't like having a dog. And that's so why I have a 4.9 because of Izzy. But you have... Um... Okay, so I was in Los Angeles visiting my daughter, and I got into an Uber, you know, from her house late at night. We'd had, uh, had some wine, obviously. Yep. And I got in the car, and I had this fabulous gay L.A. driver. And I, I sat in the car, and the first thing he said to me is, Why is your Uber rating so terrible, my dear? <laughs> <laughs> it was just like this over-the-top casual fall guy. And I went, what? And he said, yes, you are a 4.6. And now I've, I've been, I was yeah. horrified. 4.6? Okay, don't, yes. Wait, that's, that doesn't sound bad to me. No, it, apparently it's terrible. And and then I told my kids this in, in stupefaction. And because I, I I feel I'm always very polite and, I, you know, I'm. I, and then they said, Mom, when an Uber driver goes the wrong way, do you correct him? I said, of course. Um, yeah. Mom, I've seen you correct an Uber <laughs> I have to. I was expecting you to say like a 2.5 or something. No, crazy. no, but 4.6 like, is terrible. It's terrible because so, so, uh, there's great inflation. No, but then I've just been on this. It, it is like a Larry David exercise where now... I am simpering now whenever I get in an Uber. And if they go the wrong way, I don't say anything. And now I, I keep now obsessively checking my Uber rating, and it still hasn't gone up. You know what you have to do? And what? When you Baking get out of the cookies? No, I know. I, here's how I keep up my And score. I tip. I tip. I tip. Yeah, but they don't. I, I tip, but they don't see it until afterwards. Yeah. What I do is I say, five stars. Great ride. Five stars. And they go, oh, thank you. They love to hear that. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll work on that. But yeah, now I've got a Larry David like campaign to boost my Uber rate. All right, everybody, let's According like. According to Ride Guru, anything below a 4.5 requires caution. <gasps> so I'm still above caution. But it says certain drivers are told not to pick up passengers below a 4.8 when it's busy or at airports. Oh, I'd be discriminated against. Well, for wow. drivers, if you're at a 4.6, you are at the you risk of being deactivated. Right. <gasps> so. But, I mean, come on. This is like we now have to tiptoe if somebody's going. And you've had those drivers where they have no idea. Like they've just they, they've just started. Oh, I've had them. That, and, they and come they, down from Baltimore to D.C. They don't know anything. Big, and then they resent getting directions. But I just go on my iPhone. I don't watch. Like, <laughs> oh, and then I tell them they're getting five stars. <laughs> All right. Let's open up listener feedback. and then uh, And then we'll get ready for the new... I guess we're going to be entering season four. In May will be our one-year anniversary, and I'll look up. Uh, I have to look up which exact day that was. Oh, we have to, can we go to Paris for that? Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, let's. Zoe, we'll come back. We'll go to listener reaction, and then um, look forward to the new season with great guests. Sounds good. <laughs> Okay, Zoe, so what is our listener reaction that has collected in front of the studio door while we've been away? 
Actually, we did get physical mail. I we sent got you guys physical mail. Oh, we did. I put it in your pile. That you did. That I was have it. Lovely. A beautiful card. Um, we got yes. We received a beautiful card that had a drink recipe on the inside. That it was, was done amazing. in beautiful cursive. We love physical fan. Who mail. was that from? Fun. I cannot remember her name. It's on the card. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. We'll find it. You put okay. Me in charge. <laughs> ah. Okay, we'll find it. We'll, we'll find, find it. We'll It'll find emerge. It. Yeah, but thank you. Yes. So we got tons of listener feedback on our break. Um, we also got some listener feedback from some fans down under. Oh, here we go. We have her name. Rachel okay. Durr. Her name is Rachel. Oh, Wait and minute, yeah. Rachel Durr? I think I know her father. <laughs> You should read. Never mind. Maybe it's my last. We'll put my it on daughter. Instagram. That's thank you so much. Yes. Okay. So we did get some feedback from an Australian listener who didn't know if you had left or not. But I'm going to read you what he said. He said, "Hi, Femsplainers. By now, Christina is probably in Australia, so I hope you're enjoying the trip. But as a native Aussie, I have to mansplain one thing." At the end of your most recent episode, you mentioned Australia's deadly animals with some anxiety. <laughs> Now, granted, we ha- we do have the world's most venomous snake, spiders that can ruin a good day, saltwater crocodiles, and even a deadly seashell. A seashell? But I must take a lead from my expat Californian friend and point out that we don't have bears, wolves, mountain lions, coyotes, rattlesnakes, alligators, black widow spiders, or school kids on psych meds with handguns. <laughs> <laughs> I love the show. Thank you very much from your mansplainer down under. Actually, we call you a Bruce Splainer yeah. <laughs> down under. So uh, we got a lot of requests for advice. Okay, people, we, what is our, you know. Yeah, we need a disclaimer. We need a disclaimer. Like, the, we are not <laughs> licensed to give, give anyone advice. advice. And if She's you are. had, I don't know, like a half a bottle of. <laughs> I have not. I had a half bottle of whiskey. Well, all right, I had a half, but Dubonnet goes faster. I, I've had, I am on my second scotch. So, yeah, this is the perfect time to give perfect relationship time. advice. Yeah. So we'll start with a relationship one then. Okay. So this gentleman writes to us and says, hello, I am a 24-year-old conservative male who finds many of your ideas refreshing compared to those often spouted by my generation. I just listened to your episode on how do you know he or she is the one, which was the one with Isaac. Mm -hmm. And he says, I believe my friend, who is his ex-girlfriend from high school, may be the one. We mutually rekindled our friendship three to four years after breaking up a month into college. And we talk regularly. We see each other a couple times a year. I still have romantic feelings for her, and she has proven to be a comfort zone for me. However, I don't think she has the romantic feelings that I do, and I may have ended up in the, quote, gay best friend or brother level of the friend zone. Mm. What should I do now? Do I just come out and say my feelings the next time I see her? And if she's not interested, should I break off the friendship? Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, my mind is blank. What do you I, say? I have I have a strong. I know you'll ha- she'll have advice, and it's probably the worst advice. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. We we're not allowed to talk about men taking initiative in, in these situations because that's somehow sexist. But what I always tell our young men that we talk to is they're in the driver's seat. Women, despite everything want to be with a man who takes initiative, who who woos her, who sweeps her off her feet. Now, it may be that this woman does not see you as a romantic possibility, and you have everything to lose on this, but why not find out, right? Like, yeah. Like, like, if you're just going to sit there and struggle... What kind of man are you? What's his name? Sorry? Uh, we don't know. You know she oh, may okay. be wondering why he doesn't. Yeah. Uh, so but I, however, it could be a disaster and Daniel's setting you up for a harassment yeah, no, charge. But then, but then <laughs> no, don't harass her, obviously. I would plan something really nice, make right. a dinner, ask her out, and then you don't have to confess your feelings in some wimpy way. But compliment her, say something like, you know, we've known each other for so long. Think of a dialogue, but... I know a safe... I, know, I have a what's safe, a, what's a safe, safe plan. What's he would say? Because I'm only thinking, like, awkward situations I was in where... Okay, <laughs> go to a movie together. Yeah. And then try to sort of hold her hand. And then if she... No, no, nah, that nah, gets nah, creepy. Nah. If the yeah, woman doesn't want it... No, that, that you find out. If you want yeah. a guy to... 
touch you. You'll hold his hand. No, but then you get into Joe Biden problems. I would say go to dinner and then say, we've known each other a long time, blah, blah, blah. I really like you. And however, you'll, I can't give you the script off the top of my right. head, but, but, but however way. Ask her to go steady. <laughs> ask her to go steady. What happened to that? Give her a St. Christopher. No, just say, I really have feelings for you and I would like, are they shared or not? And if not, you know. I, I will never make things weird. Yeah, I, I will never raise this again. Right, but you have to know, right? Yeah. Joey, do you agree? Oh, yeah. Flush it out because I think it puts strain on a friendship. Then if you're right. if you're always there wondering, and then you know maybe if it comes to the point where you accidentally like do something that might make her uncomfortable, you know you want to sort of like so you're not suppressing the feelings all the time. Right, and he's not Talk really interested it. in having her as a friend. It sounds like he wants right. he either wants to date her or not. So cut to the or chase. Or he could ask her. Be in, a, in a nice way, he could just say, "Oh, I want to kiss you so much." Can I? You know, he could ask her. Right, yeah. but I think I think is in this. You're you're the one warning me against me approach. too. I'm not. No, he, I'm not saying he grabbed you. Know, you just you just would want to be swept off your feet and have that no, man people say, ask. I can't resist you any longer, <laughs> Mrs. Summer, <laughs> Professor Summers. I need to kiss a Rhett you. Rhett Butler just grabbing you and running up the stairs, and the next day you're a real no. That's, don't do that. That is actually kind of a shocking scene, retrospectively. Who's, and I once defended Houston, it. don't listen yeah, to that. Don't listen. Uh, no, a... but I think you you can force it, but you have to do it in a commanding and manly way. And do it, and if she's someone that's in your comfort zone, that you, you're very comfortable around each other and you know her well, do it in a way that you know if you know if she was talking to you about a relationship with a man, she would not be weirded out. Right, and, and, and give her an out. Give her a very respectable, easy right. out. Yes, Right. And note, note also that people change. Like right. someone that you weren't interested in, you could become, well, right. it could maybe. could be a Harry ago. Met Sally situation. Yeah. Right. Harry Met Sally. But keep us posted on what happened. Yeah, yeah, keep us posted right back. Okay, next one. Okay. So this one is... <laughs> one, one relationship ruined. <laughs> next one. Well, these He's are... going to be brought up on <laughs> These are now some harassment. parenting ones, so mm. maybe this will be... Not less fraught. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so this actually comes from one of Christina's former research assistants, Laura. From she was a philosophy major in your class of ninety two. Oh yes, and and my research assistant. She says I was Professor Summers Zoe before Zoe was in utero. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boom! It's true. I can't. I uh, can't fight that. Wow. <laughs> But it also says, if Zoe ever thinks that Professor Summers is high maintenance, imagine <gasps> what it would be like if you didn't have email. I write in jest, but oh. seriously, I have written hundreds of, quote, regards Christina notes. I had her signature down to an illegible squiggle. Oh, yeah, I had, she wrote all my replies and things. Because I, had, yeah, I, I, I don't think fans. we should admit this. <laughs> well, we should admit this. Yeah. well, her question is unrelated, <laughs> but she says... Do you have any advice for parents of high school boys who are looking at college? And this is specifically, Christina, have your views on liberal arts education evolved? And what do you make of those wacko parents who model cheating to get their children into prestigious schools? Oh, well, those parents are shocking. Well, give the advice about the liberal college. Okay, the liberal college. So I can, first of all, tell you colleges to avoid, like the plague. Okay. Let's do the plague list. L Sarah so we're Lawrence. Coming up, we're coming up Sarah to Passover. Lawrence, where... We're coming up to Passover so we can do the... Yeah, yeah, well, the, the plagues. Okay. The plagues. <laughs> Haverford. Sarah Lawrence. Bryn Mawr. Evergreen. Evergreen State. I would also add Oberlin. I would add Bennington. I would... I guess the liberal arts, when I think of it from like a St. John's perspective, right, with like the classical books and like reading the... the that doesn't sound like a lot of fun, St. John's. No, but it's, I think of what the traditional liberal arts education is supposed to be. I think that's probably closer to it. Yeah, that is closer to it. But I'm just trying to think of the perfect school where I would send a kid nowadays. Well, let me ask you a broader question. And not Swarthmore either. <laughs> Since you've gone through the plagues. Do... Do... Young men really have to worry about this problem, or is it exaggerated, as your son Tamler is always telling you? Like, it's not Twitter. Yeah, there are bad incidents. Yeah, there are some yeah. bad campuses, as you've listed. But most kids are going to 
college and they're not getting accused of sexual assault. No, I mean, or, I mean you do you know, have to be... You have to deal with a certain amount of political correctness on campus. And but, I think we just got have gone back a little bit. Like, did, pretend you're living in the Victorian era and you have to be an absolute gentleman. Mm-hmm. And you'll be, you should be fine. So... What, you know, we can look at it in a positive way. Is it was just, you know, the sexual revolution is over. We're going back to where, <laughs> there, you know, there were ladies and gentlemen, and we must observe all the decorum. I wouldn't have liked that. I wanted to be wild, but here we are. Spoken as the hippie. <laughs> yeah, the hippie. But, uh, fine. But so where do you go? I'm going to kind of agree with Danielle that most schools, probably even Sarah Lawrence, uh, maybe not Sarah no, Lawrence, no. <laughs> that was too far gone. There are just too many freaks. So my advice is to be careful of some of the very, very precious liberal arts colleges. Yeah. And, you know, the more expensive, the more you should be on your guard. Mm. But you, if you go to a big state university, you will find... Yeah, there's you know, there's lots of groups. The bigger the college, really, the, the better. The more. And Nat, as you know, my our son, an audio editor, went to Swarthmore, and he ended up just doing things like joining a frat. Like, he just had to find his own And he space. made great friends. And he and... made great friends. And so I, I think I think this, this idea that, you know, these colleges, let's call the colleges predatory on male students— uh, I think that can be a little bit overblown. And and look, I'm in the co- we I spent half of spring break touring colleges with our youngest daughter, who's getting ready, and you know, they're great. I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of good colleges. They're way overpriced. They're way overpriced. They're run like the expensive colleges are like five star hotels, resorts, I know. and they're oh. like offering incredible programs. I, I was touring with her, and I was like. Can I sign up? Can I go to this? College? I would. Lo- I would like to go to college. I mean, not with today's rules, but it would be so fun. And th- you know what? You can get a degree in dog training now. Really? Yeah. yeah. I love well, that. I think you need that degree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next. Next question. All right. So this is this is our last uh, advice request. <clears throat> this comes from not so much a parent, but an aunt. Or aunt. Ooh. Auntie? Okay. I'm an auntie, and you are? I'm an auntie. Well, she is a parent, but she has questions about... Problematic. Else. Okay. Okay. So Jesus. she says, Hi, ladies. I absolutely love the podcast. I'm a suburban mom of three great boys, and I am absolutely terrified of sending them out into our current world. I keep them busy with sports and away from girls. That's my current philosophy, but I know it won't work forever. <laughs> I do have a question for you, though. My 14-year-old niece has been completely indoctrinated in the intersectional feminist philosophy, as she spent many years in Berkeley while my brother was getting his Ph.D. She is constantly sharing woke but intolerant posts on Instagram. I'd love to engage, but I resist. She's not my daughter, and I don't want to start a family feud. However, I would like to comment with some little kernels of wisdom to maybe broaden her thinking. (laughs) Any suggestions on how to approach this? Oh, my God. Because I actually have a similar problem with my whole family. (laughs) Starting with Tamara. I, I, I have wisdom from my children where... I, you know, I will get exercised about something like that on Facebook. And they and they, they just said, Mom, don't be that person who comments on Facebook. Yep. Right. And that just, ever since they said that. And and I will add something, which is I I do have very people very close to me, my own sons. <laughs> and Are my, you listening, my David niece, and Tamar? Vanessa, the vegan in Portland artist. But the fact is, I love them so right. much. Why can't we all just get And along? we, they kind of know that I'm not, well, my sons are as wild as Vanessa. <laughs> but we we have, we get, the family gets right. together and everyone loves each other and kind of knows certain topics might not be popular with the whole group. But we have fun. And I think it's, maybe that's, I, like even with, I tried to tell the Roxanne Gay audience that Half my family, you know, very, very left wing. Yeah. And I don't hate them. I love them. And I kind of understand them. Right. And it's so, also a 14 year old girl. She's just she's just finding her way. And she's you know? going like, to go through a lot of like, phases. Like, 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 you know, I, David, my, my granddaughter said, did some feminist slam poetry at age 13. Amazing. And I thought to myself, this could be problematic. But, but I let it go. And yeah, they, actually, it was pretty good. Yeah, no, let them let them be them. And the kernels of wisdom, David once said something. Um, he said, he said, 
uh, children are deaf, but they see everything. Mm-hmm. And, you they know, do. telling you can walk up to a 13 or 14 year old and go blah, 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 blah. And that's what they'll hear. They'll hear blah, 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 blah. But they see your example. They see you know, people being good. They see, Christina, your example of we all disagree maybe on many things, but that's politics. Right. We're family. But this is we life. love each other. And this is love. And this yeah. is just have fun. Just, just, and I just had, bite your tongue. Yeah. And, you know. And my, and my 14-year-old self, I had a pixie cut and purple hair and a nose ring. Like, whoa. I, I, had, a, I had a poster of Mousy tongue. I don't know what I, I thought had now a, is I had cool. a perm. Well, that's that's kind of that that's, that's worse. You know what they called me at that point? I was short and really skinny, like really, like like really underweight, not in a good way. And what do you mean not in a good way? There's no not no no. When I'm, you're twelve and you're you're, and I got I got a perm. I think I was in eighth grade, and I went to school the next day, and they called me Q-tip. Oh, <laughs> oh God. Oh, no. Oh, that's harsh. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that, that kid is dealing with so many worse things. Like, I would just you know, love her and adore and find things that you exactly. that are irresistible about her. Exactly. Is there anything else? So I think that's no, I it, think right? That's it. Next week, we're going to be interviewing Irshad Manji. Fantastic. And if you don't know her, it is you such will. a treat. She's going to be your favorite author and interpreter of all things. Uh, she's a gay Muslim. A gay Muslim. And then we have we have another fantastic lineup. And we're going to have Nicholas Christakis and his everyone is talking about his book Blueprint. It's already a, close to the New York Times bestseller list. It's called Blueprint: The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. It is supposedly the most beautifully written book and affirmative and seriously serious science about human nature. Well, that's great because we're going to keep surprising you. That's what, but that's what we do here on the Fem Splainers. Bye bye bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Fem Splainers. Stay with us by following us on Twitter and Facebook at Fem Splainers, and on Instagram at Fem Splainers Podcast. You can always email questions and comments to contact at femsplainers.com. We read every one. We are part of the E1 Network and record at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. And thanks to AEI Research Assistant Zoe Appler, who is our production assistant here in the studio. And thanks to Nat Frum, our audio and video editor and occasional millennial mansplainer. And listen to us on pretty much any of your favorite podcast platforms. And please remember to subscribe and like us at iTunes if possible. Every like helps us keep our solid five-star rating. Cheers. Cheers.